Okay, yeah, so I'm going to talk today then about um, some of the main ideas uh, in my new book, Ghost of My Life, uh, which really in some ways runs parallel to, or is the other side of the, the kind of ideas that I deal with in, in capitalist realism, really. Um, if capitalist realism is about the, the complete... Um, takeover of capital, of not only of culture and economy, but also of the psyche. Um, then Ghost of My Life deals with what was thwarted by that, the traces of, an, the, traces of the outside, um, the persistences of, uh, of, of exteriority in this, in this world completely uh, dominated by capital. Um, but what I'm, really, what I'm going to do today really is bring you the bad news that you already know. Um, which is, uh, I'm going to sp you know, talk about music culture and perhaps UK music culture, um, especially as a symptom of uh, temporal uh, pathology or uh, a temporal malaise, um, which can be understood at least two levels. One is a, uh, the level of history itself, and this sense of historicity, um, a newly ubiquitous um, sense of the waning of historicity, to use a phrase from Frederick Jameson. Uh, you know, Jameson's theorizations of the postmodern, which developed in the 80s, I think, now look increasingly prophetic. And you know what was. Uh, what Jameson was theorizing in the 80s uh, is still a somewhat marginal phenomenon, still an emergent phenomenon, uh, is now ubiquitous to the point of, uh, almost the point of invisibility, I, I, I would suggest. Um, got to come back to that. Um, what is the bad news you, that you already know? Well, that it's the, that the future has disappeared. Um, the, the dimension of, of, oh, sorry, the, I meant to go to the, the second... Um, the second uh, aspect of this temporal uh, uh, malaise is the experience of time itself, uh, the phenomenological sense of time uh, in, in everyday life. And I think, um, I guess my big thesis is the relationship between these two things. Uh, the more that um, our everyday life is taken over by the urgencies of what Jody Dean calls communicative capitalism, what Franco Berardi Bifo calls uh, Samuel capitalism, the more that, that these, these, the, the rhythms and the disper dispersed attentional economies uh, of communicative capitalism take over our life, uh, the more that there is this uh, difficulty uh, in <coughs> grasping a sense of the historical moment in which we live. Um, so yeah, what's sorry? So what to come back then? So what is the what is the bad news? We already know is that the the, dim, the dimension of the future has disappeared. Um, that in some way is that we're marooned, we're trapped in the twentieth century still. Um, that what is it to be in the twenty first century? Is to have twenty first twentieth century culture on higher definition screens. Uh, or, or, you know, 20th century culture distributed by high-speed internet, actually. Um, so there's a strange, I mean, what ought to be a strange sense of repetition, of a clotted or blocked time, uh, a time that's in, in many respects slowed down or flattened or retarded, gone backwards, um, where the sense of a, a for, forward momentum of culture, which, which isn't the same as a progress, I'm not arguing that what has disappeared is a, a sense of the progressive in culture as if somehow, um, you know, 90s jungle was pro had progressed above Robert Johnson. I'm not arguing that. Um, what I'm arguing is that uh, the, the thing that's disappeared is a sense of difference or a sense of spe the specificity, uh, the sense of culture belonging to a specific moment. That is what has disappeared um, in the 21st century. Um, so there's now a feeling that nothing ever really dies, but that's not good. That means that we are um, assailed on all sides by kind of zombie forms which persist forever 
uh, by revivals, anything can come back. Um, anything, can, you know, no, anything can come back. There's, uh, there's a kind of what you, we might say an excessive tolerance for um, the archaic. But, the, the, but part of the problem is um, we, in, since the, the, uh, the sense of historicity has waned, has declined, it's difficult to characterize anything as archaic anymore. What does it mean to say something's archaic in a situation when practically everything feels old? Um, the phrase that captured this for me and which I use at the start of uh, Ghosts of My Life from Franco Berardi is the slow cancellation of the future. The slow cancellation of the future, I think, which captures um, not only that sense of termination but the gradual nature of it. Of course, it's not that the, the future in culture disappears overnight. Um, you know, it, it, uh, it withers. It, it drains away. Um, but it's, at least in terms of music culture and in the UK context, I think, I think we can, we can say that this, um, this, this waning, this disappearance, this cancellation of the future started to become evident about a decade ago uh, and has uh, intensified since then. And I think in that time, uh, our expectations of music, um, which I'm treating as, as I say, symptomatic, uh, symptomatic and, and as the most obvious example of this, but it's not as if this only applies to music. Um, um, our expectations have declined uh, and this uh, flattening out of time uh, has become more naturalised. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we anymore expect music to sound like a radical break from the past. Uh, we expect music now and culture more broadly to be a, um, you know, quite subtle. If it's different, it'll be a, 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 a subtle remodulation a subtle reconfiguration that is available, you know, that, that is available and understandable, accessible, uh, only to initiates and aficionados largely. Uh, it won't be some gross sensational shift, which uh, is, is 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 readily apparent to to anybody. Um, for Berardi, the slow cancellation of the future uh, clearly is not just a cultural thing; it's also a political thing, and of course the 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 sense of the disappearance of a political future, the sense of uh, a, uh, a future which um, would be radically different in political terms from today is, is also part of this. Um, but it's also about um, the disappearance then of uh, a, a certain linear sense of time, I think, uh, a certain narrative of time um, uh, with uh, where you know time is marked in the same way that space is marked there's a kind of time marks in the way that there are landmarks um, I think this is you know this was how those of us born at a you know in the, in the same period you know from the late 60s 70s onwards uh, you know experienced time as marked by music in certain ways that, that there, was, there was a strong connection between particular periods and and music and it was you know one could periodize music um, not only by the year but often by the month um, and that's and the sense of a rapid supersession of styles genres techniques methodologies which went along with that the sense that uh, um, the sense that uh, you know, an, uh, uh, it was really experience of of modernity um, uh, through popular culture. You know, and modernity, as theorised by someone like Marshall Berman, as this sense of permanent impermanence, as this sense uh, that uh, you know all the solid melts into air, that any particular form uh, will. Uh, it's, it's temporary, evanescent, it will be overcome, it will be replaced, it will become obsolete. Um, I, I think the way in which we experience that, not now in culture, but in terms of technology, 
you know, we experience, we, the, the experience of modernity is now in, in terms of smartphones or iPhones. That's where we have this sense of permanent obsolescence. Uh, in terms of culture, we have the almost opposite now. Nothing is, there, there's no criteria for obsolescence in culture. Uh, there's, there's uh, that, 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 as I said before, an accommodation towards the um, what would previously would be characterised as, as as the archaic. Um, but you know, part of the problem is there's no uh, effective sense of the contemporary by which one could, you know, to which one could compare the the archaic now. And that, you know, that's uh, as I said, I think been in place for about a decade. So one of the phrases that I use is there, there are non-times as well as non-places. Marco Jay's theory of the non-place as this, you know, the space of circulation of late capitalism, which are effectively indistinguishable one from another, um, you know, airports, retail parks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think um, years, time has become like the non-place. Uh, that you know, what is what was the sound of 2005? What is the sound of 2008? Uh, these these years seem to go and seem to fade into one another now. Uh, if I ask you what a sound of 1975 was, even if you weren't alive, you probably got <laughs> you probably got a sense of what it is actually. Um, but you know, I think what's characteristic of the 21st century, increasingly, especially since around 2003, is the, is that disappearance of that sense of um, uh, uh, of specificity of cultural time. Um, and you know, one of the, the the lack of distinguishing marks, that is to say, of of, of a particular period. And our sense of the futuristic now belongs to the past. Um, it has not been updated since the uh, since the nineties, really. You know, uh, in the nineties, with um, you know genres like jungle, you you felt radically unprecedented. Um, they felt like. Um, there's nothing you could, you've, you'd heard before, nor could you have heard it before. And there was a feeling then of the future rushing in towards us and we um, uh, being caught up in it. I, I think that's almost entirely gone now. The, the, you know, the futuristic, uh, when we use the word futuristic, we, it's almost the same as the word gothic. It, it refers to an already existing and established set of gen generic protocols. It's like a font, like gothic font. Futuristic means it sounds a bit like Kraftwerk or something like that. It's not actually futuristic. It doesn't refer to an actual future or indeed a virtual future that is impinging on the present. It refers to a um, set of asso already existing associations um, which uh, you know, are, are now been eternalised. The, the way to establish a lot of what I'm saying, I think, is, um, is a simple kind of time travel experiment, which is if you imagine beaming back anything, any music produced in the 21st century into 1994. Um, I, I picked 1994 deliberately because it's 20 years ago and it's hard for some of us to accept that 1994 is 20 years ago. But if, if beaming it back to 1994, what would happen if people heard that music in 1994? Um, would they go, my God, this is, this is inexplicable. I've never heard anything like this. This isn't even music. Um, I don't think anyone's going to do that. I don't think anyone would do that, actually. I think the, 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 the reverse would be the case. If you beam back music from 2014 to 1994, people are going to say, are you serious this is coming from 20 years in the future? This, this doesn't sound that different from what we've got today. Um, and, if we, and, I, and I think that's, you know, thinking of that 20-year period, uh, illustrates the kind of slowing down, a flattening of time that I'm that I'm referring to, because if you think back of um, 1994 to 1974, the vast sonic worlds that have that, that had been born and died in that period, the enormous kind of series of mutations that had occurred between 74 and, and 94, or again between 54 and, and 74, the the speed, the rapidity, the the um, the, the efflorescence. Of, of, of different sounds, different sensations um, that emerged in that period. Since 1994, I don't think, you know, I think that that's flattened out. It's not that nothing at all has happened, but I, I think it's hard to make the, the case that um, almost anything that, it, that, has, that has been produced in those 20 years subsequently was sonically unimaginable in 1994, I think. 
um, it's you know it's a whole series of fairly logical extrapolations of um, of propositions of, of 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 methodologies that were already in place, and a part of that means then the disappearance of of retro, I think, or the disappearance of of the concept of retro, in the very um, in the very universalization of retro. Um, I mean, there's always been, as long as there's been popular music, there's always been retro dimension to popular music. That's, there's nothing new about that. Um, I think what is new about the, cu the current moment then is really that the, 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 there's not the, the, the failure of any alternative to what would have previously been considered retro. Now we can ask the question, retro compared to what? What is not retro now? I think that, just, that really, I guess, follows from what I've been arguing so far. Far. Um, I guess this became apparent to me in the mid 2000s, um, which I refuse to call the noughties, although in many ways they're a decade which deserves such a horrible name. But um, was you know was when, I, when I, was walking through, um, I was walking through a shopping mall and I heard the Amy Winehouse cover of um, uh, a Valerie um, by the hot indie plotters, the Zootons. Um, and when I first heard it, in a casual listen, I thought it, I genuinely thought that this was a, a 60s record. You know, I thought that, that, so I reversed the temporality in my mind. But what I, what I, you know, I, I thought that the Zootons was a cover of this 60s song. You know, it was a production by Mark Ronson. Mark Ronson um, specializes in those kind of um, refurbished sound of the 60s. Of course, if you listen to it closely, you know, you realize that it's not actually, it's not 60s soul, it couldn't be. Nevertheless, um, that, uh, that initial response sort of indicates this kind of flattening of, 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 of cultural time that has occurred. So it's something which had come out um, 40 years later uh, could sound like, you know, that could sound sufficiently like something from that earlier period. Um, a similar thing happened when I first heard the Arctic Monkeys, who have subsequently become even more boring than they were when they started off, <laughs> which, is, which is so much even. When, you know, when I first heard the Arctic Monkeys, I saw that it's actually the video for that track, you know, Bet She Looks Good on the Dance Floor. Or that. But when I first saw that, I actually did believe that it had come from 1980, um, that uh, it was some post-punk group that I hadn't actually heard um, at the time, but had somehow been rediscovered. And almost everything about the way the video looked, the way it was shot, the clothes they were wearing, and of course the music itself, um, conspired in that kind of conspired to construct that appearance, that, that simulation. Um, and again, I think if we if we if we if we actually imagine it being played in 1980, that record, no problem. It could it could it could very well have existed then. There's, there's um, um, there's nothing to prevent it being absorbed into actual 1980. Um, and I guess the reason I mention these things is that, for me, that, that these should obviously have been classified as retro. These are obvious. Something which sa sounds like it could have come out 30 years ago uh, or 40 years ago ought to be classified as retro. Yet yeah, they weren't. They were, they, were, they were posited to us as if they were, you know, as, as if they were you know, part of contemporary music. But what is contemporary music, then, if, the, if it can accommodate music which... Um, it's not influenced by the past, but which sounds like it really could have come from a you know a, a historical moment of, of long ago, long ago. I mean, 1980 in you know in in um, 2005, 2006. That ought to have been a very very long time ago. Um, I think part of the reason for this is that uh, the tw we can see the 21st century in many ways as a disaster for musicians, actually. That um, a lot of the developments, uh, a lot of the key developments in the kind of music culture of the 21st century are not, uh, have not been good for musicians, ultimately. They, um, the key technological shifts, you could say, are to do with consumption and distribution of music rather than the production of music. Um, now it's not like, again, it's not that the 20th century was a, an ideal situation for musicians. It's not that the, you know, the days of record companies, um, advances, etc., was, uh, was a halcyon period. But in retrospect, it's looking better and better, actually, um, than now. 
Um, because paradoxically, in some ways, big record companies, um, you know, insulated some musicians from market pressure, actually. They gave them, um, you know, the, the fact that they were record company advances, the fact they could make money from recorded music, the fact that um, recorded music was a commodity that could actually um, yield remuneration. Um, you know, this, this, gave, this gave musicians some autonomy, an autonomy, I think, which they increasingly lack in, in the current moment. Um, I mean, part of the problem is uh, that we, we could say that um, a lot of cultural production has been effectively decommodified or um, uh, has become a commodity eff effectively priced at zero, whereas uh, cultural producers, uh, the things that cultural producers rely on have been hyper-commodified, you could say. You know, they still need gas, electricity, and housing, um, just which I'll re return to. Perhaps the housing is perhaps the principal thing in a, in a city like London, which can explain uh, this, this, this sense of, uh, of, of malaise. Um, but I, I, I think the other dimension of this um, in relation to technology is that this new technology doesn't yield sensations, you could say. Um, in the way that it, previous forms of technology were, music culture. Um, the music culture, you know, when you've got um, a wah-wah pedal, whatever, you could, you could obviously hear that. You could, when you had samplers, you could hear the effects of samplers. When you had synthesizers, you, one could hear them. Um, 21st century, uh, as I say, music uh, technology has certainly mutated music culture. But it hasn't mutated it in the level of what, you, what one is actually hearing. You can't really hear this communicative culture. Um, it just facilitates um, the distribution, the, circu the circulation of music. It doesn't change the actual sound of what is produced. Um, so developing this kind of thought then about why this has happened, um, why we're in this kind of... Uh, temporal malaise, uh, why in particular it's kind of music culture that, uh, that exemplifies this. Um, the first and obvious explanation then will be the emergence of the internet. And that's, you know, that, that kind of neatly coincides, I think, with um, the time I'm suggesting when, th when the future definitively disappeared uh, in, uh, around about a decade ago, the, you know, when the, the internet became ubiquitous of course, the internet was there before, but the the uh, the domination of, of our lives by the internet really only started a decade ago. And and this is essentially the argument of Simon Reynolds in in Retromania. Um, and for Simon, the key thing is the internet. What the internet provides is oppressive weight of the past. The ex, you know the accessibility since the uh, with the with the weight of the past on a. Uh, so easily available uh, to us, um, this makes it harder for, for, for the new to emerge. I think that's partially true. That's partially true, but it's not, it's not enough to explain everything. Um, another I th I th remark of Simon's, I think, is, is perhaps more, more telling, which is uh, where, where he says that what's happened in the last few years is that everyday life has sped up, but culture has slowed down. Um, and it's this, I think it's this dimension of speeding up, that um, speeding up, and here's where we come to uh, what I said at the, the outset, this, this second dimension of this temporal pathology, which is you know, the, the experience of time in everyday life, um, the phenomenology of time. Um, you know, it's this, uh, it, it, for me, and uh, this is not so much just the internet, but I think cyberspace, which is different. Uh, it's really in the last, only in the last few years with smartphones that we're inside cyberspace, you could say. Uh, you know, in, until smartphones, we went to the internet, which we accessed through computers. That already seems like a genteel age of the uh, Jane Austen world, a lot far distant from us now. Um, as soon as, you know, the, 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 I think smartphones are not, shouldn't be thought of as objects which we have, but as portals into cyberspace, which mean that we are 
that when we carry them around, we're always inside cyberspace, and we, uh, which induces a whole set of habituated reflex, uh, uh, reflexes, um, which we have to make a you know, deliberate effort to step outside of. Um, but again, that we can't we can't just see this um, this uh, emergence of cyberspace, uh, the ubiquity of cyberspace, uh, on its own. We have to see it in the context of um, neoliberalisation uh, and the combination of neoliberalisation and post fordism that I call capitalist realism. Really. Um, And so what I'd rather talk about rather than cyberspace is capitalist cyberspace. I think what we're inside is capitalist cyberspace. Um, and this, you know, this then has coincided in a country like the UK with the final eclipse of, um, of social democracy. And with it, I mean, what, what does that mean? It means um, the... End of indirect funding, I think, um, for something like music culture. Uh, you know, a lot of the uh, major developments in music culture in the UK weren't directly funded by the state. It's hard to think of. Uh, well, there are some examples uh, actually that. that um, but in terms of uh, you know popular music, there was, there was no, there wasn't, it wasn't direct funding by the state that made it possible. But it certainly, but indirect funding was certainly uh, a key factor. The example of, of direct funding by the state would be things like BBC Radiophonic Workshop, etc., which um, where you know they were uh, part of a kind of public service public um, service broadcasting remit. Um, but uh, indirect funding means the machinery of social democracy itself would mean um, things like you know student grants, um, unemployment benefit, um, housing benefit. Social housing, you know, I said earlier, probably if you're looking at a city like London as a, as a, as a particularly powerful case study here, um, the situation with housing is probably sufficient in itself to explain almost everything that I've talked about so far. The fact that, you know, it's so expensive to live in the city um, deprives, deprives the culture of energy, I think, deprives the culture of an unstressed or unpressured energy. Um, the, you know, the, the, the city is ex exhausted on lots of levels, um, you know, on, on a fairly literal level. But then as a consequence of that exhaustion, uh, as a co consequence of that uh, perpetual kind of business, busyness, um, that um, the inescapability of uh, the ubiquity of uh, urgencies, um, something which, you know, is intensified via the cyberspatial environment. I think that we, again, uh, we can look back to the to Guy Debord period, you know, Guy Debord, the 60s, the spectacle. Again, it seems like some genteel period. You had to put, put TV on then or, um, you know, see an advertising billboard in order to be uh, commanded or, or uh, have your nervous system assailed by um, the urgencies of capitalism. Now we, now we, carry, them, we carry them around at all times with us. Um, and you know, it's important to remember what you know, in Deleuze describes communication. Is, uh, communication is a command. You know, this is when when we open up, we look at our smartphones. We're essentially being commanded, and this is a, a, a weight on our nervous system that wasn't previously there. I think we're facing these um, uh, hundreds of commands every day. Uh, which we may well ignore them. Obviously, we have to ignore them. We can't possibly follow them all. Um, nevertheless, the strain on our nervous systems it, you know, must be telling at some level. Um, but to come back to, then, to this uh, social democracy and the indirect funding for culture, I, mean, I think one, one particularly important example of this in the UK will be art schools. Um, the role of art schools in... Um, a lot of the major developments of music, certainly from the Beatles, the Who, up to um, post-punk, you know, the art school was uh, a major institution there. Again, it wasn't teaching this stuff directly. Uh, it wasn't teaching people to be in groups and make music. It wasn't about that. 
Um, but the, the, the institution um, facilitated a circuit and which was at a particular kind of class dimension to it. Really, art schools in, the, uh, in that period were zones where you know, the working class could go. And it was an encounter between um, the working class and the kind of established high culture, avant-garde or experimental, um, experimental art scene. And you know, that culture, was, that encounter was highly productive for, um, for, for, uh, for, for music culture, for, uh, for popular music culture. Uh, and really, the, with the rise of neoliberalism, we've seen the dismantling of that, of that culture and its, its conditions, really. And uh, the re embourgeoisement of art schools, uh, I guess is what I'm talking about there. Um, um, you know, I guess what, you know, what would once have happened was, you know, if you were a working class kid and you said to your parents, I'm going to art school, uh, they'd say, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not wasting your time doing that, you could do something useful. Uh, but uh, you, you know, the kid, the student had a full grant, had no fees to pay, so he said, I'm going anyway. Uh, you know, with the introduction of high fees and increasingly high fees, that, that's, you know, that, that space of autonomy is not there. Um, which, with the result that art schools are now, once again, as I said, dominated by the bourgeoisie uh, in the UK. And you know, I, I think a result of what I'm talking about, or uh, one, another dimension of what I'm talking about, is the, the, uh, the stratif re-stratification of culture, really. Um, one of the things I'm interested in, and the why I think music culture was significant in, in the period, you know, from the, the, especially from the early 60s up to the end of the 90s, um, was as a space for what I would call popular modernism. You know, with you know that this art school encounter as, as a kind of engine of that, where you know experimental techniques, um, methodologies, preoccupations um, were disseminated, extended, um, and furthered, um, and popularized, you know, via via music. I think that's why was, that's part of the reason that music was important. Um, because music wasn't music wasn't just music. Music was a um, a threshold, a portal into a whole other you know set of cultural resources, really. Um, and that um, that circuit has closed down. The possibility of popular modernism has closed down, um, and instead we have a return really to a kind of kitsch high culture, which is uh, it's kitsch in the sense that it's it's still there, it persists, um, but it's no longer capable of. Um, of generating uh, novelty, um, of, of producing the new, and a return to a kind of, of, of lumpen mass culture, um, and you know that, that space where they, these two fields were uh, were disarticulated and no, no longer exists in any significant way. Um, you know, so with the with the de with the decline of with the final decline, the final attacks on, on social democracy, and um, you know it's bad enough under New Labour in the UK, but uh, you know in the UK we fell into the uh, fell into the illusion of thinking nothing can be worse than New Labour <laughs> until we had the, uh, the old Conservatives come back and we found yeah something can be worse than New Labour. And what's happened with the the, the coalition government since 2010 is uh, the, um, the the picking off, almost systematic picking off of of, of, of the last remaining elements of um, of social democracy, the, the, the uh, you know tax on social housing, attacks on squatting as well as squatting, um, the possibility of squatting in cities like London was very important to something like punk. It wouldn't it wouldn't have been possible for for punk is unimaginable in London today because of the housing situation really. Um, so I think the result of all this then is this embattled sense of time. That uh, at, at the everyday level, and the key thing was, you know, when um, I think the key thing of something like the art school um, experiment at that time was that you know that people were f there was a space in the culture where people were freed up from the pressures of work, where they could pursue uh, projects um, where they were going to lead, but the, where the where the imminent logic um, led them, not. Um, which, which which was which was radically open, um, you know those 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 kind of spaces in culture those 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 uh, those times 
Um, that kind of space-time has radically atrophied now. You know, the experience of what it is to be a student in the UK is to be, uh, you know, as, as elsewhere, uh, massively indebted um, and, you know, often working lots of jobs, working more than one job. So, that, you know, that, that's effectively closed out then this space of freedom from work and freedom from the, 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 the immediate pressured time. Um, I think what, what this also meant is um, the end of boredom. I think it's perhaps significant. Like the, um, uh, we might look up, back upon boredom as a somewhat utopian proposition now, in, in many ways. That the dialectics of boredom coming out, the situationists and going into punk. You know, what are the politics of boredom? The idea of boredom as a kind of existential challenge. That boredom presents us with the blankness of death. The 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 uh, the. the the necessity for us to actually do something is a kind of existential injunction. Um, that, that's, that's been eliminated now. Uh, that boredom boredom 1.0 no longer exists. Um, I, I, I'd say we're now in a period, of, my slogan for this would be, no one is bored, everything is boring. That, um, why? No, what do I mean by that? Well, no one is bored because we're all inundated by micro stimuli and seamless micro stimuli so the point at a bus stop where you previously would have been bored where you, uh, uh, now uh, what is the first thing we do we reach for our phones in order to cover over that the kind of terror of boredom that doesn't really get rid of uh, that doesn't that gets rid of our experience of boredom but it doesn't stop things being boring um, you know I think the particular lure of um, of a lot of 21st century culture is this mixture of uh, curiosity and boredom at the same time. We're sort of bored even as we're curious about things, actually. <laughs> that, that kind of engine of, um, you know, as we're, as we're kind of insomniacly drifting through social media uh, um, at night, we're kind of, with some level we're bored even while we're kind of curious. Um, but since there's since there's no uh, reprieve from the, the, the urgencies of cyberspace, that's what I mean by no one is bored. We, we don't have the freedom to be bored anymore because on another level, we're, we're tethered in. We're kind of, um, we're, we're fascinated even as we are bored. Um, we're distracted from our own boredom. From, we're distracted from the boring nature of things by the fact that we're always kind of, we're subject to these kind of uh, idiotic compulsion. And... Um, Again, I think that this, the, uh, a lot of BFO's work on this is very important. The inundation of the nervous system by stimuli, um, the uh, producing this insomniac state um, of uh, where, the, where it's no longer possible to dream anymore. And actually, there's a, a quite an interesting post on the the Plan C website from this uh, anonymous group called the Institute of Precarious Consciousness or something like that, where they argue. We've really shifted from an age of, of, of boredom, you know, uh, to an age of anxiety. That with Fordism, the, 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 you know, the, the, the previous regime, dominant regime in capitalism, pre presented the problem of boredom. Um, you know, you're in a factory for 40 years. That's boring. You don't want to do it. Um, capitalism solved that problem. It solved it in a way that always solves everything by the, by a kind of the uh, fairy tale genie solution. Which is okay. You don't want to be bored. I'll make sure you're not bored. You'll be anxious forever, and this, this, the kind of um, that, that's uh, the, you know, that, that, that's this sense of kind of universal anxiety. Um, I think is another thing which prevents us from um, from experiencing boredom anymore. Which doesn't stop culture being boring. Culture is boring, but there's no one who isn't preoccupied all the time who can access this boredom. Um, so I think what this, this, this calls for then is um, you know, a politics of, of, of time and um, understanding you know, these different quantitative experiences of time and how, they, um, and how you know, this is the, the attack um, on that unpressured, unstressed, um, that time free of urgencies uh, is, part of the, uh, uh, is part of the domination of capitalism over, over culture at the moment. And one can almost posit this as a metaphysical level struggle. There's, you know, there's one, there's a set of forces that want us to be permanently anxious, permanently uh, have our attention permanently fragmented, um, permanently dispersed, um, 
and that that is definitely winning. That is that that's the that's that's the dominant force at the moment. Uh, against another kind of uh, sense of time, another kind of a, a tractor, which is you know where the, towards this um, unpressured, expansive, um, more open sense of time, which is now kind of radically fugitive. I think it's very very hard to get hold of that. Uh, in, in in particular, in, in in a city like in a city like London. Which it, I think London is a kind of doubling that like if everything's block clotted um, anyway by the, the, the fact that everything's um, so difficult, overcrowded, um, expensive. Um, it's like you know, it's like cyberspace in physical form in lots of ways. <laughs> and then on top of that, you've got the actual experience of cyberspace and everyone um, tethered and trans by their by, by their phones as a means to escape it, but also to kind of perpetuate it. Um, so, you know, I'm, uh, one of the things that I, I, I sort of posit then in the book then is what, are, what, are, what, is this, what does leave us with in, sensation, in a situation where it seems that nothing new can ever really happen anymore? Um, what, what do we do? Where the future is terminated, uh, what do we do? Um, an important thing to stress here is then is not to take... Um, is, is not to adopt a, a, a too, easy, too easily nostalgic perspective um, where we say, well, yes, everything was great in the 70s, 80s, 90s, now things are really bad. Um, although I think, you know, nostalgia is easily criticised um, when uh, the, the opposite is far less criticised, which is, you know, a credulous... a certain credulousness about the present, actually. It seems to me more of a problem than nostalgia, actually. Uh, is the is the and, 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 and you know given the immense weight of the kind of uh, the PR industry branding etc. Um, and, and their role in in deliberately pro producing this waning of historicity, I think it can't be under can, un underestimated. Um, you know they uh, they are this force which gets this you know the problem with nostalgia the culp nostalgia in a culpable sense will be that makes us overrate the past. But I think that it, the, the, the problem we've got is overrating the present in lots of ways and underrating our own dissatisfaction with it, which we're invited to do, which we're pressurised to do in lots of different ways. Um, so what, uh, rather than invoking an actually existent past and comparing it with the present, I think, it's, I think the, the, the point of, of which, from which we can criticise the, the current moment, the point at which it can be found wanting, is by the, the it is in terms of the futures that were projected from the twentieth century, not the actual existing past. You know that it's the the shocking difference between uh, what we thought might have happened um, and what what actually has happened, which can be revealed by that uh, the experiment I suggested, where we beam back something in time. Um, and in the face of that, then I think we're almost offered a, 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 an opposition between. A certain kind of politicised melancholia and uh, depression, actually. It's not, not necessarily a, not that nice a choice at the moment. But, I mean, OK, what I mean by politicised melancholia, politicised melancholia would be a refusal to adjust to the, the present moment. A refusal to adjust to this, to say, I can't accept this. And that's fundamentally what I feel when I turn on the radio, actually. I turn it on, I sort of quite like this, you know, whatever track it is. I sort of quite like it, but it's not acceptable. You know, this, uh, this, uh, this, I can't adjust to the fact that this sounds like it could have come out 20 years ago. It isn't just boring rock music now, it's dance music as well, whatever. That, um, I, you know, you can't adjust to it. And uh, even if it's going to carry on forever, I think uh, I'm going to refuse to adjust to a, uh, refuse to adjust to a time when it's, ex when it's acceptable for, um, for things to be so anachronistic. The alternative to that, I think, is, is, is a kind of just depression, is a kind of naturalised depression, where we just accept that um, nothing new is ever going to happen, but it's not a problem anymore. Um, and, and, you know, and often the, this logic of depression uh, takes over where not even people say, well, you know, nothing new is going to happen now, so what? Yeah, did anything new ever happen in the past anyway? You know, it's kind of overrated. Things don't, weren't really that new ever before. We start bargaining ourselves down, not only about the present, but about anything that's ever happened before. So I, I you know, I, I suggest that this is, you know, that, that then that's part of the overrating of the present, actually, in, turn, in certain ways, is that, that those tendencies. Um, so one of the things I explore in the book, then, is these um, 
strains of, uh, of melancholic maladjustment um, as, as one strategy for the, the refusal of a present which is not really a present, and refusal of the failure of the future. Uh, and you know, the, 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 one of the th threads that I try and pull on is this, is this longing, this yearning for a future in conditions where the future can't be delivered. Um, and, I, you know, and, I, and, and what I, I guess that, well, I think that is, that is the authentic articulation in, in the present. It's not, one can't by force of will alone create a sense of the future. Um, we have to accept that the conditions which allowed a sense of futurity, you know, have really been attacked and it's voluntaristic um, action can't put that right. They've really been attacked, they've really radically deteriorated. Um, yet, uh, you know, if we're not to accede, if we're not to completely submit to this, this present where the future has disappeared, um, you know, what remains is a, is a certain set of longings, um, yearnings, etc. And it's a kind of fidelity to those yearnings and longings that are, uh, is one of the things that I track in, in, in the book, really. Um, okay, we'll leave it there if, uh, if that if, uh, seems a point, a point to end, but that's okay. Okay, well, thanks everybody. <laughs>